Thanks so much for coming today. I'm, I'm so excited to be able to introduce Alessandro Acquisti to you today. Um, Alessandro is uh, uh, an associate professor at the Heinz College at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, uh, one way to describe what he does is uh, he works on the behavioral economics of privacy. Um, I tend to read him and cite him for his very interesting work on um, human computer interaction and, and the, the um, influence that design has on people's behavior and expectations, which I think is, is a fascinating line of research. But that's not all of his research. His research is um, uh, uh, quite extensive. And Alessandro is one of those um, academics who uh, is taken extremely seriously within the um, academic community, but also uh, increasingly by policymakers. And so Alessandro's work is, is very influential. Uh, and I, I, I know from talking to them at the Federal Trade Commission and, and elsewhere. Um, and uh, so we're delighted to have him here. Uh, today he's going to be talking about privacy and augmented reality. I just want to point something out because this bothers me what happens to me. But um, So Alessandro's been thinking about augmented reality for a long time now. Right, thinking about it before Google Glass or any of these other things, you know, he's been sort of thinking this is this is a trend that he's anticipating, and he started to do these a series of uh, of experiments and this in this research in anticipation of a time that has that has already come. And for those of us doing technology policy, this is increasingly an issue where technology outpaces even our imagination about what might be what might be possible. Um, anyway, I think you'll you'll find this work extremely exciting as I do, and uh, thanks everybody for coming. And Alessandro, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Ryan. Um, thank you to you for being here, inviting me here. I'm, I'm delighted to give uh, this um, this talk tonight. I will uh, I will get to the part about augmented reality probably midway through my presentation. I, I, I hope it will all make sense by then. I will get into the privacy part immediately. What I what I really we'll try to do is to talk about the power of frames, uh, of influencing the way we think about the privacy debate, and also the way we make decisions about uh, the debate and our personal privacy. Let me start with an example of what I mean by the power of framing. This example comes from uh, behavior economics. Um, I'm an economist by training. Um, I study here in the Bay Area. I, when I moved to CMU, I started getting more and more interested in behavior economics. So not just the trade-offs associated with protecting and revealing personal data for the data subjects and the data holder, but also how people make decisions about these uh, trade-offs. So much of my work is experimental in nature. We get human subjects, sometimes in the lab, sometimes in the field. Sometimes they know it's an experiment. Sometimes they are told later that it was an experiment. Sometimes it looks like a survey, but it's not. Sometimes it's something else. And we randomize them. We randomly assign it to different experimental conditions. And we manipulate things across the different conditions, things we want to study. In this particular case, we wanted to study the impact of what economists call the endowment effect on privacy decision making. Let me tell you what we did. We went to a shopping mall outside Pittsburgh, and we asked people who were passing by the shopping mall whether they wanted to participate in a survey. Now, the survey was actually a decoy. It was an excuse. It was of no interest whatsoever to us. It was just an excuse to make subjects believe that that was a study. But in fact, the study started when the survey ended. Subjects who have finished the survey were offered a payment as a thank you for having participated in the survey. Different subjects were offered a different type of payment. Some subjects were given a gift card, Visa gift card, that they could use online, offline, wherever they wanted. And they were explained what this card uh, was about. It was a $10 gift card, and it was anonymous, in the sense that the names of the subjects would not be linked to the transactions done with this card. Some other subjects, instead, were given a $12 card. In the description of this card, they were explained that this card would be tracked. The transactions done with this card would be linked to the name of the individual receiving this card. So we endowed subjects for a few seconds with either card, 
And then after about maybe 40, 50 seconds that they've been endowed with a card to each group of subjects, we told them about the existence of the other card. So the subjects who were initially given a $10 card were told, hey, there is a $12 card. Would you like to swap your $10 card, which is anonymous, and get a $12 card, which is more valuable, but this one is trackable. So we're asked to go from 10 to 12, but also reduce, in a way, the protection of their future transaction data. Whereas the subjects who started with the $12 card were told, hey, by the way, there is a $10 card. Would you like to swap your $12 card, which is trackable, for a $10 card, which is less valuable in monetary terms, but this one protects your privacy or your future transaction data? Now, of course, you can see how, in reality, there was no change whatsoever to the choice set that the subjects, regardless of the experimental condition, were facing. The decision remained, uh, do I want a $10 card with privacy in that my future transaction data will not be linked to my name, or do I prefer a $12 card with less privacy? But in fact, the framing was different. For one group, the framing was, do I want to receive two more, two more dollars to give away my future, future transaction data? To the other subjects, the framing was, do I want to give back two dollars to protect my future transaction data? Now, in that effect, we suggest that subjects would uh, answer differently this question. Even if the choice set was identical, the framing was different. The question was, by how much? So, on this graph, I have on the y-axis the percentage of subjects who, across the different conditions, chose the $10 anonymous card. And here, I have the subjects who started with a $10 endowment. So these were the subjects who were given the $10 card were asked to swap to a $12 card. You can see that about 52% of the subjects kept their card. 48 swapped. 52% did not. So about one of those subjects said, no, I don't want two more dollars to give, away, to give away to you my future transaction data. I prefer to keep my less valuable card because my privacy is valuable at least $2 which was a remarkable result in itself. Two dollar privacy. However, the other group, which was given a 12 card and was asked to swap to a 10, and again, was facing exactly the same two cards, chose in a very different manner. Now this group, fewer than 10% of the subjects chose the $10 card. Now 91% of the subjects kept their $12 card, more valuable, only 9%. 91% kept their $12 card, only 9% moved to the $10. So now we have a, a power of framing, or endowment effect, as it is known in economics. In the application to privacy is, uh, is the story that we face every single day as we decide continuously whether to pay for protection of our data, how? By using cash rather than credit card, by using this social network rather than that social network, by using Tor rather than normal browsing, or in fact, whether we decide to give away data for more money. At the grocery store, we use the grocery loyalty card. We get a discount, more money, but we reveal more personal information, and so forth. So the frames I want to cover with you today are not just this experiment. This experiment was an example of the framing. But there are three important frames that I want to discuss because uh, they permeate the privacy debates, the privacy debate. And I find them very interesting frames. And I'm going to try to propose some opposite frames. I'm not going to argue that one is wrong and the other is correct. However, I do hope that by the end of this talk, I will have at least uh, instilled the doubt you, that in reality, we don't really know for sure, in empirical terms, which frame is more accurate than the other. So the first frame is privacy is about uh, transparency and control. And you will see what other opposite frame I will propose. Another frame is uh, internet content is free. Another frame is big data increases, aggregates social welfare. I'm going to discuss each of them. I'll start with privacy is about transparency and control. So the connection between transparency and control and privacy is uh, well established in the literature. 
uh, well established in particular in the United States where transparency and control are seen as good self-regulatory solutions to privacy troubles. Do we have a problem with privacy? Give more information to the consumers, give them more control of data, the problem goes away. I'm going to claim that privacy, the control and transparency in the area of privacy are necessary but not sufficient conditions. So I'm not going to say that transparency and control are bad. I'm going to draw the distinction between uh, in mathematics or in logics, what you need to have to solve a certain theorem and what is sufficient to have. And I'm going to claim that neither transparency or control are sufficient for privacy protection. Let me give you some example. The control story, or in fact, the paradox of control, is a series of experiments that we ran uh, and we are still uh, um, running because we keep discovering new things in this area. It relates to the paradoxical impact that making people feel more in control of their personal information can have on their propensity to share data. You can find an echo of this in studies which have shown that uh, when you make people feel more protected, they end up taking more risks. So you ask people to wear seat belts or helmets when they are riding or driving, they start driving or riding faster. It's also connected to another stream of literature known in social psychology as the illusion of control. How sometimes we human beings feel we have control over events which are truly outside our control. Now, if you ask them rationally, people will admit that, yeah, maybe we cannot really influence that event but we still act as if we could. For instance, we go to Las Vegas, and we play craps, and we want to get maybe double one, and we throw the dice very, very softly, because double one is connected to our brain as one plus one small number, so soft dicing. We want to get double six, we throw harder, because it's a 12, it's a bigger number. In fact, uh, of course, you have no control whatsoever on the outcome just by how strong or soft you throw, but somehow you feel you have to do it that way. So in the case of privacy, there is indeed in a very established literature defining privacy, in fact, as a control of a person's information. More control, more privacy. We wanted to see whether there are cases where more control means less privacy. And because this is a pretty bold uh, statement, let me try to refine it and, uh, and, uh, and put caveats and limitations, delimitations to that. What I refer to is that in situations where we make people feel more controlled, they will end up revealing more sensitive information to more strangers. So we ran uh, several experiments. In a talk like this, I'm not going to, I'll try to go broad rather than deep in the sense that I'll try to present many different experiments from different streams, but only one for each stream. Of course, if you're interested in each stream, I usually have five, six, and more experiments of the same uh, type, uh, and I'm happy to share them with you if you want. <laughs> the particular sample which I will show about the paradox of control is the following. We ask students on campus at Carnegie Mellon University to fill out a survey which included some non-sensitive and some pretty sensitive yes-no questions. Probably it's, uh, in fact, slash that, not probably, surely, you cannot even read uh, what is up there on the screen. Let me tell you that there were questions such as, uh, uh, have you ever been late for class? Yes or no. Have you ever used marijuana? Yes or no. Have you ever cheated on a class? Yes or no. Combination of sensitive and non-sensitive questions. We told the subjects, students, that no answer was uh, compulsory. They could simply choose not to answer anything. But what they did answer would be published in the appendix of our final study. And this was one of the experimental conditions. We had uh, four other experimental conditions. In this talk, I will present just one more. The second experimental conditions had exactly the same questions, exactly the same order, with very similar instructions. But there was a change. The subjects were told, once again, that they were not forced to answer any of the questions. However, they were told that in order to give us permission to publish, they had not just to answer the question, but also check a box. The box there, the square, was a publication permission. So what we did was to make explicit the power that the subjects also in the previous condition had, but it was implicit. The subjects in the previous condition could also decide not to reveal and not publish, not to allow us to publish. The subjects in the condition were given this uh, 
extra power, at least uh, this feeling of extra power, because they had to check the box to allow us to publish. Without that box, we wouldn't be able to publish. So status quo bias or default settings bias would suggest that subjects will not spend the time checking that box. Because although it's a very small cost to do so, it's a non-zero cognitive cost. You still have to go there and click. Our prediction was exactly the opposite. Our prediction was that precisely because we had put there that checkbox, A, subjects would click it because they would feel empowered. B, e, more important to us, they would become more likely to answer the questions and, in, fear, in fact, to allow us to publish the answers. And this is exactly what happened, and dramatically so. In this graph, I have on uh, the y-axis the response rates. The percentages of subjects who, across the different conditions, decided to answer and to allow the publication of their answers. And splitting the two conditions, the implicit control, the one you saw on the first slide, and the explicit control, the one you saw on the second slide, they are blue and they're red. And I'm further splitting the question into sensitive or intrusive and less sensitive or less intrusive. And what you can see is that there is a strong main effect by giving more control or making the subjects feel more in control. We have a jump, a dramatic jump in the propensity of the subjects, not only to answer, but in fact to allow the publication of the answers. And this jump is particularly strong, which was what we were hoping and expecting in the more intrusive questions. It's what in empirical behavior research, you would call it an interaction effect. We were hoping that there would be a statistically significant interaction between the sensitivity of the questions and the control. Because that would tell us that the impact of a control is particularly powerful the more intrusive the question is, which is what we found. On the transparency side, there has been by now lots of debate on the limitations that privacy policies have in terms of providing transparent information to subjects, individuals, citizens, website users about what will happen to their data. For instance, we know that no one reads them. If they read them, they have a problem understanding them. If they don't read them, or even if they read them, they make wrong assumptions about what they really mean. In fact, if we take all this approach seriously, if we do believe in transparency as a way, self-regulatory way of solving privacy problem, then we have to face gigantic uh, opportunity cost. And we have uh, the author of the study right here, Alicia McDonald, study with Laurie Krenner. Gigantic opportunity cost uh, calculated and estimated based on the average number of websites that the average US uh, consumer goes to every year, how much time it takes to read a privacy policy. And if you put this all together and you take uh, the, I think probably you use the average uh, salary rate uh, of uh, US workers, you end up with this uh, pretty gigantic number. Not only that, sometimes some companies can bypass the privacy policy with uh, impunity. Well, OK, but we wanted, so this is all well known. We wanted to push the envelope further. We wanted to see whether, in fact, uh, companies can somehow change things in front of your very eyes and get away with that. So they tell you what they're doing. And you react to that. And you see consumers adapting their behavior in order to be more protective. And then they change the game again. So let me show you. This is uh, uh, unpublished work. So I put it under the caveat that it's not yet peer reviewed. Um, it's based on data which we have been mining from um, Facebook network over the time. Uh, my team and I were among the very first to mine data from Facebook. We started in the game very early in 2005, seeing what publicly available information was available on CMU network from people who were creating profiles and openly disclosing personal information. And we've been doing, we have been doing that over the years. And what we found, if you look at the perspective of an unconnected profile on the CMU network, so a profile inside the network, which looks at all other profiles of the CMU network, it tries to see how much these other profiles are revealing to you. But it's not connected to any of them. It's not a friend. So in effect, it sees the public disclosure within the network. We have seen that over time, for 
pretty much all the fields. And I'm only showing here some of the fields. I don't know if you can read the information. These are interests, music, books, movies. I have the same trains for things like hometown, so more PII type of, PI, PII type of information. We see a trend, uh, and our trend. What's on the y-axis? The percentage of profiles which were making that information available to an uncodated profile. So back in 2005, for instance, lots of people, about 70 to 80 percent, were making say, the movies visible to anyone else in the CMU network. The percentage keeps going lower and lower and lower and lower over time. As more subjects become aware of the potential privacy implications we reveal into much publicly. And then there is something which happens around 2009. You have a jump going up. Anyone remembers what, uh, what could it be? What happened? The subjects suddenly decided to reveal more in group, in mass, policies and default settings. The power of default, the power of changing the game as the game is going, and you have an uptick now in more disclosure. Suddenly people who have tried to disclose less and less find themselves disclosing more. And then you see, in some cases, a restarting of the downward trend for some fields, not for all of them. At the same time, we were interested in observing what instead a connected profile can see. So a connected profile is a profile which is friend to others. So I don't presume that both because of the limitation of the resolution and because of so much stuff is going on here, that you can follow everything. But the big picture here is what we are trying to show with these uh, um, figures is that over time, to a connected profile, the amount of information you can, you can see from other profiles keep growing and growing and growing. So in other words, we have two completely different dynamics. In the CMU Facebook network, uh, the average person was revealing less and less and less and less publicly, but more and more and more and more to their friends. Okay? Make sense? But in fact, not only to their friends, to Facebook itself. Because Facebook is the silent listener of all that communication. We were interested in pushing this story further and seeing whether indeed we can call it almost a slate of privacy. An idea of uh, look at my hand here so that you don't notice what I'm doing with the other hand here. So look at all this control I'm giving you to how much information you're revealing to your friends, whether your uncle can see your date of birth, whether your sister can see your, your movies, whether your dog can see your date of birth so that you're paying less attention to the fact that I'm monitoring everything. So in another experiment, and once again, this is just one of many that we run, and this is also, by the way, work in progress, so it's not fully peer-reviewed. It will appear in a workshop in uh, June in Berkeley, um, uh, but that's just one sub subset of the studies we have done for this. Once again, we got students, Cardin uh, Gellon, by the way, we. We often use students, but we also do lots of studies with non-students. So we, we, we try to be you know, equal opportunities in terms of subjects. So we, we tell them, hey, we are doing a study about uh, um, um, uh, behaviors, and we would like to, you to answer a certain set of questions. The questions included non-sensitive and sensitive questions. To one group of subjects, we tell them, hey, there will be other students who will read uh, your answers. Instead, to another group, we told them there will be students and faculty who will see your answers. And then we measure how much each group of subjects were willing to reveal in terms of answering questions, depending on which experimental condition they were assigned to. So here we have a response rate. We have a strong, uh, strongly, it was a statistically significant difference between the propensity to reveal across the two conditions. The subjects who were in the condition where they were told other students will see this were much more likely to answer the questions than the students who were told students and faculty will get this. Okay? So you could make, a, I guess, a fair inference here that one group of subjects were more concerned about the others because they were less willing to reveal. But then we wanted to see what happens if uh, you change slightly the, um, the scenario faced by the subjects. 
You change it in the sense that you tell them exactly the same thing, so you're fully transparent. Imagine a privacy policy, you're giving them the same information. Only that, you do the slate of privacy, the magician. In one case, for instance, we wanted to see for how long subjects care about that information, for how long even they remember that information, so we added a delay. The subjects in the control conditions were given this information, transparency about uh, these students or student faculty will read your information, and then immediately answer the question. Subjects in another condition were stopped for some period of time, and then were asked to actually answer the questions. So my question for you is, how long do you think we need subjects to wait for them to forget and start acting like there is no longer any difference in care between students and students and faculty. 10 minutes, 5 minutes, Five. 1 minute, how about 10 seconds? So when we add the 10 seconds delay, <laughs> the statistical significant difference in propensity to reveal disappears. They are revealing exactly the same. Um, or if we ask them something irrelevant, such as, would you like to receive uh, something by email? And then we start asking the question, same effect. The difference disappears. It's a slate of privacy, right? You are giving full transparency. You are telling exactly what you do. But then you also make them wait, make them focus on something else, and then the behavior changes. So the implications for me is that I'm not so sure that self-regulatory solutions predicated around the control and transparency are the final solution to the privacy problem. Once again, I see control and transparency as important, but I see them as necessary, not as sufficient solution. To use a term which is becoming more and more um, trendy in policy circles, is a problem of responsabilization. This term is used to refer to situations where someone creates a problem and then pushes the responsibility on someone else to solve it. So maybe we are creating this responsabilization problem on users, which is different from individual responsibility. So if one frame is privacy is about transparency and control, the opposite frame here is, uh, no, privacy is about protection from control. It's about what people can do to you when they have enough information about you. And what do I mean by that? Different scenarios. They can, meet, they can make judgments about you, which may be biased, may be wrong. They can make, make inferences about you that you do not really want them to make. They could influence you in a very pervasive, subtle, invisible way. Let me give you some examples. Let's start with the biased judgments. I became so interested in this topic because as more and more of us reveal more and more of ourselves online, some suggest that everyone will have their skeleton on Facebook 10 or 20 years from now, so no one will really be, count, be accounted, considered accountable for the silly things they did, they uploaded, they shared 10, 15 years ago. So you know what? We wanted to see whether that's the case, whether you can really delete your young mistakes from the minds of other people, so that when they see now what you did 15 years ago, they will say, well, 15 years ago is a long time. Let's move on. So what we did, once again, several different experiments. I'll show only one. We tested what is the impact on others of the information about you provided now by referring to either your recent past or your distant past. And information being, quote unquote, because I'm about to use terms which a social psychology, psychologist would be horrified by me using in such a careless manner. Good information, bad information. Positive, negative. So we gave, in this particular experiment, we ask subjects to read a story about a Mr. A. By the way, this is an hypothetical experiment. We also did a pretty cool version of so happy when it worked using a dictator game. If any, if any of you in the room it comes from economics, you know what I'm talking about. With real money, we found exactly the same effect with a dictator game involving real monetary incentives. But this one was hypothetical. Our subjects were randomly assigned to five conditions, and they were told to read the story of Mr. A, and then they were asked to answer questions about Mr. A. Do you like Mr. A? Would you like to work with Mr. A? 
Subjects in the baseline condition saw this pretty baseline version of Mr. A. Mr. A was born in San Diego, got vaccination, social security number, moved to San Sacramento, attended high school, after graduation moved to Texas. Another group of subjects saw a slightly different version of Mr. A, uh, which I'm highlighting in red. Of course, the subjects didn't see the red, clearly. They saw everything in white. They saw an additional aspect of Mr. A life. Just about graduation, Mr. A found, found a lost swim purse containing $10,000 in cash, reported the discovery to the police, and the rightful owner retrieved her money. So something pretty good about Mr. A, finding $10,000 in cash, bringing it back. Then after Godesha moved to Texas, where he has been living and working for the past 12 months. So a very subtle manipulation in which we are basically telling the subject that this uh, cash finding bringing back event is 12 months ago. Another group of subjects saw a version of Mr. A in which Mr. A finds the cash but does not bring it back to the police. Therefore, the rightful owner never got back her money. And then Mr. A, after graduation, moved to Texas, where he lived for the past 12 months. Another group of subjects went back to the good Mr. A, finds it $10,000 in cash, brings them, the, brings them back to the police, rightful owner, gets back her money, moves to Texas, where he's been living and working for the past five years. So again, very subtle manipulation. Now we are locating temporally the good deed as happening five years ago. And you see where this is going, the last version, the, the, the last condition experiment, Mr. A doesn't bring back the money, moves to Texas five years ago. So we have a two by two plus one uh, experimental design, one neutral condition, so to say, and this two by two. Recent information, old information, positive, negative. Now we know from uh, um, evolutionary psychology and other studies that people remember more ne negative events than positive events. This is very well known. But Notice that here it's nothing about memory. We wanted to test something which is not about memory. We know that humans tend to remember negative events more than positive events. But here is about, I give you the information now about the recent past or distant past. And I want to see effectively how you discount information about others, depending on whether it's good or bad. So for this particular question that I'm showing, we ask on a liquor scale, one to seven, how much do you like Mr. A? One, I don't like Mr. A at all. Seven, I like Mr. A a lot. And the green line, in reality, is a point, is the average liquor value of the subjects who were given the baseline story of Mr. A. The subjects like Mr. A, 4.5. Median value, makes perfect sense. Not too much, not too little. It's a line, but in reality, it's a point, because there was no recent or old in the story of Mr. A. The blue line, the two points are the subjects who were told that Mr. A was uh, brought back money. In one case, recent, this happened, was reported as happening 12 months ago. In another case, the old was reported as happening five years ago. And what you can see is that there is a statistical significant difference uh, between the blue point and the green point when it's presented as a recent. So subjects who saw Mr. A bringing back the money but this is reported as having happened 12 months ago, they like Mr. A a lot, or it is significantly more than the baseline. Sadly, just telling that this happened five years ago completely nullify the good deed. It's like it has never happened. No impact whatsoever, no marginal impact whatsoever on the appreciation of Mr. A. Not so lucky with the negative information. The negative information negatively impacts Mr. A regardless, independently of the time when the negative information is referred to. We have a strong effect, strong statistical significance uh, compared to the baseline, no statistical significance across the negative information. In the sense that positive information about you is discounted very, very quickly. Alessandro won the PET award for privacy and technologies five years ago. What has Alessandro been doing since then? The negative information about you is not discounted. It stays there over time. So internet is inability to forget, pretty problematic. Couple with our brains who, if I'm extrapolating very wildly and very aggressively, aggressively our inability to forgive. The second protection, protection from unwanted inferences. For 
people, what people can infer about us starting from very little information about us. Starting just from our face, for instance. So we did a recently a study combining face recognition, social network, privacy, and a number of other things. The motivation for this study was the observation that there is more and more and more self disclosure online, in particular photos. Back in 2000, this is an estimate I found on science, 100 billion photos were uploaded online. If you were not a celebrity, most likely you didn't have a photo online. Up to those, sorry, let me rephrase it. Not 100 billion photos were uploaded online. 100 billion photos were shot on camera. Of those, a fraction, very small fraction, were uploaded online in 2000. In 2010, instead, everyone has photos online. Only on Facebook, only in a month, we have 2.5 billion photos up uploaded. Pretty much in the same period of time, 97, 2010, face recognizer were getting better and better and better at detecting and recognizing people in photos. The FERRET program, which the Department of Defense started in order to have a matrix to uh, cross compare the accuracy of computer face recognition over time, had almost a three order, almost a three order of magnitude improvement in that span of time. So our story was the following. If we take the fact that people are disclosing more and more personal information online, particularly photos, particularly through social networks, identified photos, because we tag them, because we use our real first and last names on social networks. And we combine this with the fact that the recognizers are getting better and better. If we combine it to the fact that nowadays, thanks to cloud computing, every one of us has uh, at their fingertips the processing power that Ten years ago, only the NSA or the largest corporations would have added. And if we combine it to the fact that I don't need the physical control of uh, Amazon cloud services, I just need a phone which access the service. And if we combine that with the research on statistical identification, which over the years have shown all these interesting things, and we have uh, one of the most interesting um, people doing work in this area in this particular room, showing that you can cross uh, compare voter registration lists and medical data and re-identify apparently anonymous uh, medical uh, sensitive medical research data. You can combine Netflix data with IMDb data to identify apparently anonymous Netflix data and so forth. You put all these technologies into a big mixer and you end up with our research question. Can we use entirely public level information and entirely off the shelf technology for the purpose of uh, massive peer to peer automated real time uh, individual re-identification based on faces online and offline, and then inference of sensitive additional information again starting from faces. And this is what we did. So we ran a number of experiments. In one experiment, we started from a dating site. We downloaded faces, images from a dating site. Why? Because on dating sites, people use their faces, their images. You don't, you don't get a date. But they don't tend to use their real names. Then we used Facebook profiles. We didn't even get into the Facebook, so we didn't even violate the terms of services. We got off the Facebook what you, I, anyone can get through a, so, uh, through a search engine. Uh, we, we used the primary profile photo, which most of uh, Facebook users do make searchable online. And we use uh, a cloud computing cluster to basically run uh, hundreds of millions of comparisons between the identified set, primary profile photos from Facebook, and the unidentified set uh, photos from the dating site. And sure enough, if we find a good enough match, which we validated uh, in a number of different ways, now we can give a name to the up until then anonymous dating site profile. Using this approach for the geographical area where we did this experiment, a North American city, we were able to re-identify in the sense of give a name to the pseudonymous, to one of the 10 pseudonymous dating site profiles of, the, of a particular dating site. In the second experiment, we decided to do it not online to online, but offline to online. So we went on campus. We asked students, in fact, anyone who was passing by on campus, it just happened to be overwhelming student whether they wanted to participate in an experiment. If they did, they sat in front of uh, our, one of our computers, and they, we took a webcam shot of them, and we asked them to fill out a survey. 
as they were filling out the survey, their image was being uploaded to a comp cloud computing cluster in which it was in real time being compared to images which we had previously downloaded from Facebook profiles. By the time each subject had finished the survey, the last page of the survey had been dynamically populated in real time with the 10 best matching photos which the application had found for that particular person. And the subject, I had to click on a box saying, yes, I see myself in this photo, or no, I don't see myself in this photo. In this case, for instance, this subject did find himself in the photo. And so did about one out of three of our 93 subjects. But then we said, OK, let's push the envelope further. So, what we did, essentially, in this period one and two, was to show that you can start from a pseudonymous or anonymous face. You can use uh, face recognition. The particular tool we used was PitPat, developed by CMU, not by us, but other great research by CMU. The company was acquired by, by Google, so it's, um, the researchers now are still in Pittsburgh, um, but working for Google. And, and we can find, for instance, a Facebook profile, combine these, the, 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 these trails. But, some of you may perhaps know of a study we did in 2009 in which we did something different. We started from Facebook profiles. That's just one scenario because we could do it also with other data sources. We compare the information, demographic data from Facebook profiles, which is demographic data for people who are alive. We compare it to data of people who are dead included in the death master file, also known as social security death index, which is a gigantic database of all the social security numbers issued in the United States. But of course, the, the data goes there only once a person is dead. And by some interpolation and statistical analysis, we ended up predicting the social security number of the people in uh, the Facebook profile. So the idea was interpolating data from the people from the file with uh, demographic data of the alive individuals date of birth and state of birth, we could statistically, not the deterministic, of course, SSN is a nine-digit number, but uh, probabilistically predict the SSN. So you see where I'm going with this, right? So the idea is that if we combine all these studies together, the story becomes, can you start from a face from which you don't even have a name, and then you find a name using face recognition. Once you find a name, you find also the profile, but from the profile, you find the demographic, and from the demographic, you find the social security number. So can you indeed predict social security number or any other type of sensitive information from faces? This is exactly what we did. With the brave subjects uh, from experiment two who agreed to participate in the extension of experiment three, for part of them, 27% of them, we were able to predict uh, their first uh, five digits of the SSM with four attempts. I will not get into the details of why we didn't focus on the, on the last four. We can predict also the last four, just uh, we need a huge sample size to have something statistically valid, not the sample size that we are talking about here. But the story really is a broader story. It's a story of data accretion, which is a beautiful term. I'm not the one who coined it. I don't know whether it was you guys or Paul Holm. Huh? It was a Zoom, actually. I've been using it, but uh, you know, it's all So pa pa Paul Holm was the first one? I think he was the first one. So uh, uh, shoot out to Paul Holm. Like capital accrues over time, data accrues across databases. So the story here is that you can start from an anonymous face, and then uh, you can find a matching face online. Once you have a matching face, you have a presumptive name for that person, probabilistically correct. But if you have the name, you can find much more public level information about that person. Now, if the, if the name is John Smith or John Doe, good luck. If the name is, you know, Ryan Carl or Alexander Christie, is the set of people with the same name is much smaller. So you can be pretty sure that you are getting the correct demographic data. But with that, then you can start making inferences, much more sensitive. Social security number in our story, sex orientation, credit score. And then you bring it back to the anonymous face and you close the circle. So really, the story here was, and as a proof of concept, we developed an iPhone app just to make the point that we are close to the point where you can take pictures of people, upload the picture to the cloud, compare it to 
databases of photos you have previously found. Once you find a good match and you have, you have name, you, the script automatically looks for data from zabasearch.com, usapeoplesearch.com, these demographic sites. If you do find demographic data, then you plug it into the algorithm we developed in 2009, you predict the SSN, and you send it back to the phone, and it appears on the face of the person. The story of augmented reality I promise you to get during my talk. Now, how distant are we in that kind of future? From the kind of future, our iPhone app works. It's a proof of concept, but it works. It's not scalable. We cannot do it on 300 million people for computational reasons. The costs are huge, even using cloud computing clusters. The false positives, when you start comparing, I, I, I like the joke when I give this talk, that similar talks, that when you start comparing faces on the order of hundreds of thousands, you realize that you are not the unique and beautiful snowflake uh, you really want to believe you are, because many people look like you. But we are getting closer and closer to that. In fact, so close that in a few years, 15, maybe 10, we will not even need to do it on going around with our clumsy cameras. And everyone sees that we are doing it. You can do it through your contact lenses. So this is a study which came out a few months after we came out with our study. It's not about face recognition, but it's about the first contact lenses which include an antenna and a LED. The antenna is a Wi-Fi, so it communicates to a server. The LED projects information on the cornea. So that this uh, rabbit, is not a human uh, eye, uh, but the rabbit did survive, was receiving information coming from the internet or whatever server was chosen. The point being that it's not so distant the future where we will have these contact lenses, and we will be making inference about each other of the type I'm describing in real time. And if you imagine even more computational power and the ability of cameras of doing more and more and more high resolution photos, this was a famous photo from Vancouver shot uh, in a, with a camera which you can zoom in and you can see the detail of the faces of each of the about 15 to 20,000 people in Vancouver waiting for a final hockey game to be played. So you can uh, imagine a future where in instantly we can recognize many of them, minus the false positives. Not only that, but because you recognize them, you can also compare this information you have from the offline world to the information you have from the online world. How they are connected on social networks, Twitter, whatever else, which means that in real time, uh, by the way, we are not there yet. Computationally, this is crazy, crazy expensive to do right now, but we will get there. So in real time, you can find even the hidden connections between people. Now, this maybe is a security dream in that in real time you can find something bizarre about these uh, seven people all connected to each other, all in the same big crowd, but distant from each other. But it's also a very, very creepy future in terms of liberty, freedom of speech, and democracy. And then the protection of control, and other problem of control as well, from invisible, pervasive influence. What I'm trying to say here, this is the second frame I wanted to discuss. Internet. Content is free. Here, I'm getting to the more politically and policy charged part of the discussion. Internet content is free. It's, uh, we, 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 we like to believe it. Up to a point, it may be true indeed. Although more and more, you hear people saying, well, it's not really free. In fact, there are even jokes. This was uh, um, um, sent by a friend of mine. The two pigs are in the slaughterhouse. They just don't realize it. And I say, isn't it great? We have to pay nothing for the barn. And even the food is free. And the tagline is that, well, if you're not paying for it, maybe you're, the, you're not the customer. Maybe you're the product. So this internet content is free. Now it's being changed into, well, data is the price you're paying for free content. And I'm going to argue that, once again, I'm not taking sides here, but I want, to present, I want to present opposite frames. So I want to critique each frame. I would say that you can critique even this frame, in the sense that in this frame, data is the price you pay for a free service. Even this doesn't necessarily tell the full picture. Why? Well, this is a picture which has gone around blogs and Twitter and so forth about the advertising technology landscape is incredibly complex. There are so many intermediaries, intermediaries between uh, you and the ads which appear on your screen when you're going around the internet. There are billions of dollars of profits, even more of revenues to be made. 
thousands, hundreds of thousands of people working, so much is going on. And yet, when we talk about data is the price for free service, magically, we are condensing this gigantically complex landscape into an Edgeworth box. Edgeworth was a British economist from the 20th century, the 19th century, sorry, who used a box as a description of an economy in which there are two people, Robinson Crusoe and, say, Friday, who are in a desert island, and they only have access to two goods, guavas and lettuce. And they have a certain initial allocation of these goods. For instance, Robinson Crusoe has 80% of all the guavas on this island, and Friday is 20%. Whereas, Friday is 80% of the lettuce, and Robinson Crusoe is only 20% of the lettuce. Somehow, this uh, allocation is not optimal because uh, they both prefer more of the other item. So they will be better off uh, by splitting differently these resources. Therefore, they can indeed negotiate a trade and move to this other point, realizing what economists call the a Pareto improvement, and move it to a situation where you know, Robinson Crusoe has 40% uh, of guava snap and 60% of lettuce, and vice versa Friday. Everyone is better off. And now we are in equilibrium. If nothing happens in this economy, nothing happens in this economy. We are there forever and ever and ever. So now, replace guavas with data. Replace lettuce with content. Replace consumer, sorry, ID with consumer. Replace Robinson Crusoe with Facebook. So the idea that the online economy is data for privacy sorry, data for free good, for content, to me, is missing something. Something is missing from this economy, right? I mean, you, you have to explain to me why, why the consumer is playing Angry Birds, Facebook is making billions of dollars. There is some aware of something else which is happening. There must be some other flaw which the data for content uh, frame uh, doesn't fully tell us. The money coming to the data holder may be coming, for instance, from merchants who want to advertise. But of course, where does the money from the merchant come from? Eventually, from the consumer. Now, more and more, you can see the internet as a beautiful market where you go, you offer all this free content, you sample, you like it, you eat it, as you're eating it, there is the data marketing guy there who in the, in the back is observing you and study every move. And then, sure enough, you go home with a new Cadillac and you don't even realize how you bought it. So the idea I'm suggesting is that we don't pay just with data. The consequence of data is the fact that we buy products. So what is interesting here is that there may be all sort of nice cross uh, um, 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 support between different types of consumers. Those who spend less, uh, uh, those who spend more, are going to, in a, in a way, supporting the internet browsing of those who spend less. It's interesting, really, to study the fact that if one frame is data is the price for free service, the other frame is, well, there is no free lunch. The last frame that I'm going to discuss is uh, big data increases aggregate welfare. There is no doubt that the power of big data, of uh, improving efficiency, making us discover new things, improving people's life, is there. For instance, in uh, a recent paper by Omer Teme, uh, there was a discussion of how the potential deadly consequence of, of Vioxx were discovered in a way through what we would call nowadays big data. By comparing the uh, purchasing habits and the um, medical history of a very vast number of consumers and discovering that there were interactions between drugs which would create adverse effect, uh, in fact, deadly adverse effect. The argument then becomes that if you use privacy to decrease the amount of information available to the marketplace, you're going to lose these benefits. You're going to kill people. Now, 
this is an exaggeration, of course. But if you take, uh, go back to the early days of the economics of privacy, to the work by seminal Chicago school scholars in this area, such as Posner and Siegler, you see quite definitely that privacy in economic terms is seen as redistributive, creator of inefficiencies. Regulation is unnecessary. In fact, if you have regulation, it creates even more inefficiencies. However, if you look at the other literature in the same area, in the same stream of economics of privacy, more recent literature, you start finding also a different story. You start finding situations where, you know what? Market equilibria in the market for personal data privacy not necessarily bring you optimal uh, solutions, not necessarily increase efficiency. You can have uh, private benefits outweighing social benefits. You can have uh, externalities and costs due to the secondary usage of data. You can have uh, more than optimal investment in trying to acquire and process consumer data. You can have a situation where regulatory data protection can have ex ante welfare increasing effect. Not only that, another stream of literature will suggest that the more big data, the bigger big data you have, the more surplus goes from the consumer, the data subject, to the data holders. In the sense that you can predict so well the behavior of the subjects that you're going to charge price discrimination exactly the maximum price they're willing to price for a certain good. So this is the theoretical story, right? Now, of course, I feel that the reality is kind of in the middle. Now you have to frame. One frame is big data increases aggregate welfare. Everybody's better off. The opposite frame is much more gloomy and doomy. Big data only extracts consumer surplus. Reality is probably in between. However, and to conclude, I wonder whether if we only think about the extremes, we are going to accept the wrong frame. We are going to accept the frame that privacy protection and value of big data are opposite, are the dichotomy. What if it's a false dichotomy? What do I mean by this? I don't know how many of you have seen uh, ever before the up to confidentiality map was a seminal contribution to the literature on confidentiality by jo Professor George Duncan, SEMU. The idea was that you can put on a X and Y axis data utility and disclosure risk. The idea is that there is a monotonic increasing relation between these two variables. The more data you have, the more utility you can derive from the data. You know, big data, you analyze all the medical records of all consumers, you can find the interaction between drugs, which otherwise you would have never discovered, you save life. But you also increase the risk that the data may be abused. So if you want to decrease that risk, you're also decreasing utility. So you have this problem. How can you then protect privacy? Protecting privacy means making data less usable. This view, however, and this is not a problem with George, George Duncan approach at all. It's a problem of how it is being used. Does it consider the fact that across uh, industry and academic research centers, here in the Bay Area, in Massachusetts, um, and across the world, more and more research has gone in the field of privacy and anti technologies. The best privacy and anti technologies don't simply stop the flows of data, but allow data to still flow while protecting certain aspects of data. So if you look at the literature in this area, you can see that we can have uh, apparently paradoxes or magic scenarios, such as you can authenticate yourself without identifying yourself. You can retrieve information without telling the server what information you're retrieving. You can search a data set while leaving the data set encrypted. You can do operations while leaving the data set encrypted, homomorphic uh, encryption and so forth. You can do privacy preserving data mining, collaborative filtering, even an oxymoron in theory, such as privacy preserving targeted advertising. Now, I'm not going to claim that we have completely a free lunch. Like I said earlier, I don't believe in free lunches. I don't believe it here. There is an element of uh, decreasing utility when you start, uh, start using privacy and asset technologies. But the point is, uh, whose who's utility? When we start using privacy and asset technologies, where exactly is the loss in utility? Is it in aggregators, society as a whole is worse? 
or at the level of data subjects only, or the level of data holders only. And the point I'm trying to make is that we don't know. So I promise you at the start that I wouldn't tell you what I believe is the correct frame, but I would hope to at least disseminate the doubt into you that we know exactly which of these frames is more correct than the other. Each of us has their personal ideas. But empirically, it's very difficult to know where we are between those frames. And in a way, this is a challenge for us, as social scientists, as privacy scholars, and so forth, to try to discover eliminate the question mark and try to understand better where we are on these frames. I went very long, so it's better if I stop here. Thank you for your attention. So uh, I enjoyed your talk very much. And uh, for me, one of the things that comes out of your behavioral economics work and also behavioral economics research in general is that it can be seen as a somewhat uh, dim view of the human psyche and human cognitive abilities. It's not the full picture, but you know, there, there's a lot in that nature. Um, and so this naturally leads to a policy question that I'm hoping uh, we can get your opinions on, which is, should we, you know, should regulators in some circumstances protect consumers when they, when they don't even necessarily know that there is a threat, uh, when, when they're not clamoring for protection, for example, that you know, sort of paternalistic view of regulation. So do you see uh, this body of work as naturally pushing in that direction, or are there counterbalancing forces? Um, thank you. Uh, great question. I'm, I'm glad you didn't ask me about the do not track list, because I was afraid that from where you were going that there would be a do not track list. Liz, question on which I have no, no opinion whatsoever. On this topic, I do have an opinion. And my answer is uh, um, yes, we should use the results of these studies to influence policy. Uh, yes, it may sound paternalistic, but you know what? There is no neutral default setting. The idea that we live uh, in these uh, uh, perfectly free environment, free from influence, free of manipulation. And then the government arrives and paternalistic, paternalistic forces you to do something. To me, it doesn't respond very much, correspond to reality. The reality is that we are constantly under the influence of many different forces, many different powers. So even not doing anything is a very precise choice. Because even choosing not to act, means accepting certain influences and certain powers. So to me, the question is less about paternalism and more about, in economic terms, whether you believe that free market forces by themselves can achieve an optimal, quote unquote, equilibrium or not. And to me, the literature says a resounding, we don't know. Because like I, like I showed in the slides, and I'm, I've been working on this for a while, and I've been doing reviews on the, on the economics of privacy, you take a stream of literature, and you realize that, yes, market forces will achieve the optimal equilibrium. In fact, any regulation will distort the marketplace. We want to protect uh, employers against employees from uh, employers who want to snoop and check all their drug records. Well, we are removing information from the marketplace. By removing it, we create inefficiencies. And in fact, we not even achieve our goal, because you know what? If someone has something to hide, they will hide their drug records. If someone has nothing to hide, they will volunteer their drug records. They will take their blood and do a sample, say, here, I don't have anything to hide. So the argument goes, if you take the similar literature, is that regulation is at best ineffective, because uh, people want to reveal good information and want to hide the bad information, and the worst is actually redistributive, uh, inefficient, and so forth. But then you take other streams of literature, other, uh, other authors from the same stream of literature, and you find different results using very similar models. What, where, where, where does the reality lie? That, that, that to me is, is a huge question, and that's wh why over the years I've become more and more interested in empirical work rather than purely theoretical work, because I wanted to see what really happens when you start 
playing with the data. I'm not saying that that is conclusive because you can play with the data so much that you can push the data in a certain direction, but we try to get at least some empirical validation for, 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 these, uh, for these models. Okay. Alessandra is always fascinating, and, and, and actually this, a lot of the stuff uh, that you've been thinking about I haven't, I haven't actually seen, and, and it seems to have evolved even from, from Colorado where I saw you last. Um, so I, you know, I've been thinking about writing about this, but I think maybe you're better positioned, or maybe we can write it together or something like that. I'm not really sure. So we've, know, we've known for a long time that firms, companies, are aware of the ways in which we're predictably irrational, right? They know how to exploit anchoring. They know how to exploit prospect theory. Um, and in many ways, your work has been about applying people's pre you know, predictable rationalities uh, to privacy and, and seeing what sort of shakes out. I mean, you know, that's, that's not generous enough. I mean, but it, in a sense, that's some of what you've been doing. What's really unique and interesting about privacy to me, though, as it lines up with behavioral economics, is the fact that privacy is about getting information about people. Presumably, Although each of us is susceptible to certain, each of, each of our ration, rationalities are bounded, right? And each of us is susceptible to certain irrationalities. Presumably we're not subject to the same ones or to the same degree, right? In other words, you may have a terrible anchoring fetish that I don't share, but I really go in for, you know, visceral factors to, to talk to you by your colleague Lowenstein. So one of the interesting things about privacy is that one of the things that safeguards is what my particular irrationalities are, right? So if we know from Hansen and Kaiser and others that there's going to be a market incentive to exploit people's irrationalities, isn't it interesting that in privacy uniquely, you have the added layer of, gosh, these companies are not only going to understand that if they give me something for $12 and I hang on to it for 10 seconds, I'm more likely to, to, to keep it. But they're also going to figure out exactly what irrationalities I'm uniquely susceptible to. And that doesn't seem to be part of your picture, at least, I mean, maybe unpacking the big data extracts consumer surplus, maybe that's part of the story. But for me, the story is so interesting about privacy is more information means we know who's predictably irrational to what extent. And I wonder if you could comment on that at all. So thank you. These are, these are beautiful questions. There are several points I would like to make. I'll probably we, we, we forget many of them. I hope at least at least a couple of them to to, to, to be able to, to to discuss them clearly. One is uh, starting from before getting to the final point you were making. First, a, a general parenthesis is is true. Behavior economists sometimes or behavior decision researchers seem to discover what the industry has been knowing and using for a long while. Um, in, in, in terms of influencing uh, behavior. So we try to do these studies uh, because we feel, you know, th there are two ways to, to use results such as ours. There is a kind of the, the dark way of uh, trying to use them to nudge the consumer uh, uh, to, to exploit, uh, extract even more data from the consumer without the consumer really realizing. And there is the other way, which is uh, alerting people that way, well, there is dynamics. So when someone says that we just need to provide more information to consumer, transparency and control, and we we'll solve the problem, maybe not. And then you make the decision you want, but at least we pointed out that um, that is, may not be a sufficient condition. Now, specifically to your point, this is something which, which indeed I didn't cover, the fact that the more you know about people, the more you can realize also uh, which particular biases they may uh, suffer to in what extent, and the more you can use uh, personalize in a way the biases. Now, once again, going back to the debate I was mentioning between a free market approach, um, which believes that privacy is best protected by uh, competition, and a alternative story which suggests that ah, perhaps that's not enough, perhaps we, we, we need regulatory protection. You, 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 you can see an analogous de debate here between those who believe that the problem is just not enough, not the, the protection of privacy, but not enough information. In the sense that when everyone knows about everything about everyone else, then we will be all protected in the sense that 
Yes, the company can know you so well that they can exploit your specific bias, but you also have so much information about the company that you're able to counter that bias. It's a kind of a pushing the envelope forward. I don't remember, I, I don't know how many of you remember a beautiful book by David Breen, The Transparent Society, the idea that privacy is best protected when uh, the monitors are being monitored. That's one way of seeing things. There is another way of seeing things that the dramatic information asymmetries that we face nowadays will persist, will continue. In the sense that, yes, we all desire and hope and want that more information will set us free. And therefore, yes, companies are better able at influencing us, but we are better able at predicting companies will do that. But there is no guarantee that that is really going to happen. Because to me, there will always Put it in this way, and I know here I'm pushing the envelope, I'm going off, off the far end from economics into, into almost a political statement. For me, information is power. The information asymmetries re reflect the asymmetry of power. So it's not clear to me that we will ever be, or how long it will take to be, in this uh, ideal future, utopian, where we have so much information about the data holders that we can hold them accountable for their, for their attempts at nudging us and exploiting our biases. So about these two stories, you can see how I'm more comfortable with, with, with the latter one I mentioned, but I accept, at least in, in, in the intellectual terms, the existence of this possibility that full information will solve the problem. I just don't find it likely. I think he was here first. Thank you for a fascinating presentation. I'm curious about the intersection between identity and behavioral ec uh, economics. Uh, in this country, in the US, we have enshrined in the Constitution the right to privacy, and we have the McCarthy error when people were being bugged. And in other countries, there's a whole different set of legacies and in other languages. I'm curious if your studies have at all looked in terms of privacy um, nas internationally uh, across languages, um, and whether they are even extensible. I ask from world university and schools perspective, 200, 200 countries, 3,000 languages, all on the web. Could one extend your studies um, and begin to draw helpful data in this time of change with the information age? Uh, thank you. Another beautiful question. So let me try to uh, two three points here. Uh, we, we are doing some cross-cultural studies uh, using Facebook, for instance, to understand differences in uh, um, observable behavior on Facebook in different cultures. Uh, we, th there are many other researches we've done cross uh, cultural comparison of privacy. And here you, 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 you find, as usual, in, in research, different views, right? Some views suggest that, well, um, privacy is so culturally dependent that there are some cultures with almost no sense of privacy. And other views instead they suggest that privacy is uh, a universal need of uh, human beings across times and, uh, and societies. What changes is the particular embodiment that the need for privacy takes. Uh, I remember reading um, a beautiful uh, uh, book by Shorman on the I think the title was something like The Philosophical Foundations of Privacy. It was a collection of essays. One of the essays was by, I believe, a, a anthropologist called Murphy, who spent time in Java and Bali trying to understand what kind of, what privacy meant in those, in, it, it was in 1950. So at the time, not very uh, technologically developed, um, the two islands, trying to understand what privacy meant in the different cultures and finding evidence uh, that Indeed, privacy is universal, but could take different forms. In some, in some cases, it's about creating a physical space which is separated from the outside so that you have a place to be alone, as in the Warren Brandeis um, definition of privacy. And in other cases, it could be about very stiff social etiquette, in that the social etiquette becomes stiff precisely in order to protect you from invasions of others that are not supposed you to be too invasive with your questions. To me, this issue of how, no doubt, the privacy is culturally dependent, obviously, but how much is culturally dependent and how much is a universal human need is a crucial issue 
And Ryan knows that I'm actually working on, on, on that particular question. I have a study ongoing. I cannot say anything about that, especially because we are recorded. If you like, I can discuss offline. <laughs> have you done any of your studies exclusively online? Have you done this experimental work without a, a situ, without place? Have you done, uh, are any of these experiments virtual? Oh, 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 absolutely. No, we try to do, we, we, we try to go all the way. We, we use students, no students, we do it online, offline. We do what things look like surveys. So our dependent variable are never, what we don't do is asking people, how concerned are you about your privacy? Or if we do, we do it as a, as a trick or as a manipulation question. What we are always interested in actual behavior. The behavior could be whether you answer or not a sensitive question, but it's still a behavior. In cases, is what card your choice, you choose, and, and so forth. We, we try to be as, 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 as varied as possible because we, we, we know uh, sociologists, anthropologists have, have, have rightly so sometimes criticized behavior, experimental psychology and behavior research for focusing too much on uh, weird people. I don't know if you've read uh, or if you've heard about this paper, the weirdest people in the world, weirdest as in W-E-I-R-D, R-D being uh, white, um, 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 educated, uh, uh, industrialized, uh, uh, I don't remember what the R was for, the developed. So most of the experiments that are usually done in, in, in these fields are with students in educated uh, countries and so forth. We also fall for, for that, of course, where it's limitation, but we try as much as possible to, to, to go wide. Thanks. Fascinating talk. Uh, I could ask a number of questions, but uh, one I'll sort of look at in the middle line on the data is the price of free services. In some ways, advertising has, has often been matching is the price for free services, you know, depending on whether it's newspapers or radio or television. And I'm wondering if you're looking, thinking about online and, and sort of the settings where you're really discovering data, it's, could it be even worse that it's new data? And as the data fusion cycle continues, you'll have to give up more and more data for it to be new data. Mm. Or is it, you know, so is the dynamic even worse, <laughs> unfortunately? Yeah, it's interesting. That's a very interesting angle. I, I don't know. I don't know. It, it could be, right? In one story, you can imagine how they, 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 you, you want to or there, there, there is this desire to get more and more data out of you. In another scenario, almost science fiction scenario, there is, a, there is a ultimate ceiling, uh, and if I reach that, I know everything I need to know about you. Which is kind of creepy, right? The idea that you can summarize a human being with a finite amount of information. And once I have reached this finite amount, I know you. I know how to influence you. I know what you want. I know what triggers your pushes your buttons. How long is this data? How long a data trail do we need about a person to serve the best ad. Do we need a week of data? Do we need seven years of data? And if you use uh, seven or 14 years of data, are we forcing you to remain the same person you were before, or are we, you, are we allowing you the freedom to evolve? And as well, and I thought you were going there with your question, maybe not, maybe yes. In my strong uh, going for very opposite framing, I didn't mention something very important, that there is uh, also in the advertising literature a debate between the value of advertising, decreases search cost, matches people, inform uh, good to people, and the power of advertising will make you believe you want this good, right? And once again, it's not black or white. The two things can, be happen, can, be, uh, can happen at the same time. You have uh, great services coming from targeted advertising because you can find something you otherwise would that not have the time or the imagination to discover. Or, slash end, you can be nudged exactly the right time of the day, exactly the right day of the week, exactly the right position on the page and the right color which only works for you to buy this good at this price rather than that good at that price. All right, so I think two things which I hope will link, and if they don't, let me know. But one, I think one of the things that Ryan was getting at is that, and you touched on this, economists, as far as I can tell, at least some of the Chicago types, perfect price discrimination doesn't matter because 
the, the social welfare is the same. It's just moved in terms of who gets it. So I think one of my, part one of my question or, or the related part is, does anyone care? Or is your point that may be, but there's a different question that's non, uh, not about economics that we have to think about. And related to that, when you describe the idea that maybe you'd get a picture of an audience where all of a sudden you realize a whole bunch of people had connections where you didn't think they did, is it possible that that is actually not as unexpected given the literature on six, or I think Facebook suggested there's really maybe only four degrees of separation, which leads to this overall question, which is it possible that what you're describing is an almost inevitable movement towards this outcome, which you have most surplus will go to those who can process the information regardless of hypertransparency because of the nature of the computational power and the network that you're describing. And were you referring with the second question, were you referring to the picture of people in the crowd? Eh? Yes, exactly. Like, so it seems creepy, and yet, as I understand some of that literature, which I don't know very deeply, that some people would say, well, of course. And in fact, there's an irony, perhaps, um, as a tangential issue, which is you might get such a wave of, of course, everyone in this room turns out has some level of connection, but what, we, what that means and what that looks like, God only knows how to process that, at least right now. Yeah, uh, good point. So, uh, and, 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 and again, here you can once again make two, two different stories, right? The, the story I chose to highlight is the story of creepiness, that you are in the crowd, you are anonymous, maybe exercising your right of free speech, but in fact, uh, your name is seen by the cameras, not only that, all the connections you have to other people in the car you see, and that's creepy. The other story is that, well, these technologies will be so cheap, and like we did it on the mobile phone, anyone will be able to do it, and this, this will give amazing power, a counter power, right? Yes, we know that the camera is working on us, but at the same time, we are controlling who is using the camera. Well, I'm actually arguing, does it create such a noise that you have to it, it keeps it from a noise perspective? Not oh, noise. In fact, and you easily get into science fiction scenarios. It is easy to start thinking in terms of science fiction, not in, in a uh, derogative terms, but you can easily think that, to frame it this way, uh, if, uh, if information becomes truly available to anyone, all information available to anyone, you can see, you can interpret this as a perfect world. Finally, we have that. And that's one way of seeing it. Another way, more cynical, is that, okay, even information will be available everywhere, there will be still a, a, a fight for knowledge. So th there will be always an arms race between uh, how we'll have technology that will mask my face, you will have technology which penetrates the noise created by my technology. And how much money you have, and I have, will affect how good my masking, cloaking algorithm is, how good your uh, demasking, decloaking algorithm is. And so we, back, we go back to square one, where we started. That is, it is, once again, about power. And about the first question, um, yeah, I mean, uh, oh, the, the typical, the simple answer here, I mean, simple answer is a huge problem, but I'm kind of just, just to get the, the basic uh, point. Uh, typically, when we, as economists, we work with uh, uh, parity efficiency, ma maximization of um, um, aggregate welfare, without paying that much attention whether it's aggregate welfare, how much of it is consumer welfare, how much of it is, say, firm welfare. In fact, the situation where a, a, a one agent, economic agent, Donald Trump, has one trillion dollar, and uh, 99 other agents uh, are homeless, can absolutely be Pareto efficient. Uh, in that, in order to improve uh, the, any one of the 99 homeless, uh, the Donald Trump agent needs to take some money away and pass it there. Um, Amartya Sen and, and, and other economists have worked on, on, on different uh, definitions and, and metrics uh, for economic prosperity. Uh, it is true that mostly our models uh, focus on uh, Pareto efficiency because it's more tractable. But there is ongoing work, of course, in economics to 
to, to get a bigger picture. And maybe it's a story also with privacy, right? That if we only see it in terms of efficiency, we can get a certain answer. If we see it in broader terms of prosperity and freedom and so forth, we may get, once again, a different answer. I love your work. I don't have anything as intelligent as a question. Um, but a couple of things seem to be bleeding into each other, and I wondered if you're seeing the same things I am. So if we're doing the data is the price for free services, what happens when you don't have the transparency and the control and you don't even know that that's happening? And as a concrete example, we have the loyalty cards in supermarkets. And for many years, they were not about data. They were about, you will shop at Safeway and not take your business to four stores. And then data got added, and people didn't know. And then in California, there was a law passed that no data can't be used for anything other than that purpose. You can't resell it, and people don't know. And it's very difficult to see that as a marketplace when you have that level of information asymmetry. We have a natural experiment here, right? Um, but if you talk to people in general, they have, in some cases, no understanding that the data behind the loyalty card could go anywhere else. And if they do, no understanding that different states treat that differently. How does that fit into doing a trade between Friday and Crusoe? Thank you. Another great question. Another usually difficult, uh, complex uh, area because we're being economists have been trying to think in terms of uh, explicit markets for personal data, at least dating back to 1996, and probably even earlier than that. The first paper I remember in that area was Kenneth Loudon, uh, NYU, who wrote on the communications of the ACM, a beautiful paper on markets for privacy, suggesting that there will be one day data warehouses where consumers put their data, take out their data, sell their data, rent their data, and so forth. We don't have that because uh, every year or so, I mean, the program committee of some conference where a new paper inventing, reinventing this wheel uh, comes up and facing the same problems that all the approaches have, have, have been facing, which is uh, we resolve the problem in a different way, implicit payments. So rather than having explicit warehouse where there is a buy and sell your personal data, there are data is being transacted as the secondary aspect of another transaction. So you go on a search engine, you're looking for information, you're selling data. Uh, you use the loyalty card, you're getting a discount, but you're buying a good. So there has been, a, a, there have been attempts to create, uh, or at least to think in terms of explicit markets for personal data, which may have one big benefit, which which is at least they make the transaction transparent. They make you see exactly what is going on. But there are many other challenges for why they didn't work. The secondary usage of data is one. Difficulty consumers have in assigning the right value to their data. I am underselling it. And the fact that these ideas of a data warehouses were predicated about a, a world we no longer live in, a world where your personal data was mostly static. Was PII, your PI. Now you're, the very sensitive, interesting information about you is dynamic. Is what you create in the engagement, in the transaction with other entities. In doing so, you reveal your preference. But your preference may not be static. They may change. So this, to me, these are the challenges which, which have made it impossible to realize those markets. I'm not saying that it would be beautiful to have those markets, but one appealing side would be that at least they will make explicit what currently is hidden. Um, I see. So how is this a marketplace when some things will have a different factor and they don't the same as the consumer? I see your point. Sure. I think we have to end on that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.